Glory to Jesus Christ. And so we're reading the encyclical of Pope St. John Paul II, The Splendor of Truth, Veritatis Splendor, encyclical letter of August 6, 1993, regarding certain fundamental questions of the Church's moral teaching. And this is... You can obtain this from www.usccb.org. I think you can get it online. Uh, also, that's the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Publication number 679-4, Washington, D.C. So this is uh, the 14th printing of this. Uh, with the copyright 1993 of Libreria Eritrici Vaticana, the Vatican publishing house and bookstore there. There's also the Daughters of St. Paul, uh, St. Paul Books and Media, Pauline Books and Media. I think you can still get that there. Well, we're on, let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. O heavenly King, come for the spirit of truth who are everywhere present and filling all things. O treasure your blessings and giver of life. Come dwell within us and cleanse our souls, O gracious Lord. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy immortal one, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy immortal one, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty one, holy immortal one, have mercy on us. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. So this is in, still in chapter two. Do not be conformed to this world, Romans 12, two. The church and the discernment of certain tendencies in present day moral theology, or in some cases, immoral theology. So this is a page 88, The Judgment of Conscience, number 57. The text of the letter of the Romans, which has helped us to grasp the essence of the natural law, also indicates, remember, uh, uh, Romans 1 and 2, chapters Romans 1 and 2 especially, <clears throat> also indicates the biblical understanding of conscience especially in its specific connection with the law. Romans 2, 14 through 15, quote, When Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature what the law requires, they are a law unto themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that what the law requires is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or perhaps excuse them, unquote. So the reality of, 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 the, of natural law manifested through nature, do to others as you would have them do to you, by reason, following reason, uh, without uh, diverting on, onto one's uh, uh, greed, lusts, uh, whatever, uh, uh, hate, hate, all of this into going off into the, the capital sins. Uh, if you follow that, and that, of course, that's the, 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 by the impulse of grace, because that can only be by, gra by grace, since we're so uh, damaged in the fall, the, uh, the reality of what the Western Church calls original sin. According to St. Paul, this is page 89, According to St. Paul, conscience, in a certain sense, confronts man with the law and thus becomes a, quote, witness for man, a witness of his own faithfulness or unfaithfulness with regard to the law, the law carved on the heart, the law carved on the stove, the tablets of the Ten Commandments, uh, and uh, uh, of his essential moral rectitude or iniquity. So he's either... Uh, fulfilling 
the uh, the law carved on the hearth, the natural law, uh, which is underlined by the revealed law, uh, the the moral aspect of not we're not talking about the ceremonial law, for or the aberrations, the you know, the sort of uh, tilting towards the code of Hammurabi rather than to uh, do to others as you would have them do to you that you could find in in a, uh, in a literal surface interpretation of of uh, many scriptures old testament scriptures but not if you really seek the fullness of the mosaic tradition let alone the fullness of the apostolic tradition in the new covenant Conscience is the only witness, and only is italicized, since what takes place in the heart of the person, and by heart it just doesn't mean feelings, it means the center of the person, the, the, the moral uh, juncture, shall we say, of, of the person, of intellect, of will, and the like. Conscience is the only witness, since what takes place in the heart of the person is hidden from the eyes of everyone outside. So uh, people don't really know our motives. Sometimes we're confused about our motives ourselves, uh, of, of what we're doing things. But usually the actions reveal this, at least to some degree, uh, whether they're good, uh, good motives or bad motives or are really mixed motives, which is often the case. The latter is, is often the case. Conscience makes its witness known only to the person himself or herself, and in turn, only the person himself knows what his own response is to the voice of conscience. So uh, only the person can really say, no, again, of course, our actions reveal a great deal about things. And people who know us, they, you know, they might know a great deal, but uh, the very center of ourselves is between us and God, really. And in turn, only the person himself knows what his own response is to the voice of conscience. So this is 58. The importance of this interior dialogue of man with himself can never be adequately appreciated. The, the, the interior dialogue with myself, the, the, the disparate aspects of myself. But are they all centered on the, the real source of unity, which is God? Or are they, am I, I'm trying to rationalize, am I trying to uh, get in good with the, the people in power or the fashionable people or, or whatever, or, or into some group? rather than, is this what God really wants? Is, is this truly right? Is, is this uh, objectively fulfilling the objective call to, to rectitude, to, to, to sanctity, to uh, justice toward others and toward myself in this? Or am I rationalizing, it's good, uh, which is seems to be often the the way out that many people use. So so take Thomas Jefferson, for example, who was a deist. He wasn't really a Christian. He was a nominal Anglican, but I think he thinks he was even a vestryman. Uh, uh, but uh, he believed, he didn't believe in the deity of Christ, he didn't believe in the Trinity, he didn't believe in miracles. But he did believe in God. And we believe that God was just, and he did believe in natural law very strongly. So usually when they talk about reason in the 18th century in, in, the, in, uh, uh, in Europe, uh, it was usually natural law, what they were talking about, that what, is, uh, what one can discern by the application of reason, by the application of, of uh, analysis, uh, what, what this would be rather than relying on uh, revealed law, like the Ten Commandments, so, um, or, or other things, um, or other claims to revealed law. 
So he uh, knew and do to others what you would have them do to you was, was important. And he even made his own, uh, shall we say, summary of Jesus' teaching, moral teachings. But he was a slave owner, and apparently a slave seller too. And he got into debt and all of this stuff. And he knew this was wrong. He knew it was wrong. And uh, he had, I think it's fairly uh, well proven that he had children with a slave, Sally Hemings, who was, uh, uh, and uh, he was tormented by this. But he went the the way of the, of the rationalization. He said, "Well, yeah, I will need this for." Uh, so you look at his earlier writings and then to some of his later things. There's a contrast. He he gives in. Uh, he it's it was very difficult to uh, buck the system, especially since he was all caught up in it uh, with his debts and all this other stuff. Uh, and his uh, his liking of luxury in that uh, he he needed to uh, stand on the backs of of enslaved persons, so uh, so he all this highfalutin language, you know the the Declaration of Independence and things like that. Uh, well, it was it was hard to make that decision, and Jesus never said it wouldn't be hard. Take up your cross and follow me," he said. He didn't say, "You know, this will be a breeze." So there's that example of Thomas Jefferson there. But uh, uh, so we we don't want, especially when it's going to be really hot, uh, difficult, or there's going to be a cost. The cost of Pentecost, as someone once called it. But uh, what uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer called the cost of discipleship. If I'm really going to follow Jesus as a disciple. It's not going to be easy. There's the uh, the powers of this world. You know, they may like to, uh, you know, use, you know, pat Jesus on the head maybe and say, but then dismiss him for all that, unless they they're quote unquote honest and they're uh, out to get him, which they can't do because he's risen from the dead. Uh, but. Uh, there's that that problem. We see that, of course, with abortion, and this. Uh, and I'm in the United States, and that, and how uh, people uh, you know, wrap themselves. There are people who wrap themselves in Christianity who applaud abortion, you know, who will bless abortuaries, who will uh, get that, and uh, often interfaith. You know, they'll try to get a reformed Jewish rabbi, and, so, and they'll have the you know, Episcopalians and Presbyterians. And uh, Unitarians and others uh, to uh, uh, bless this uh, this high altar of of Moloch, uh, and then that. So, and, and there are, uh, I'm sure many of these people are sincere, but if it, if they pursued the science, if they pursued the uh, do unto others, which which you would have done to you or do not do to others, which you would not, there, there, there would be a real difficulty, a real difficulty. But it's a, a convenient thing, if, especially if people are going to live the uh, sexually irresponsibly and all that. So that uh, someone has to pay the price. And especially if you can dehumanize the someone who's going to pay the price, which is what they've always done. The few people of power have always been dehumanizing the uh, their victims. So this so so uh, it comes to the point where uh, initially you might say, "Well, this is this is bad," this is, but it has to be, and we just start to uh, uh, shout your abortion and applaud this, and, uh, and, and use all this language of freedom, of license, but that's the satanic delusion. All that. And of course, you can do this on the other side. You can do this on, uh, in, uh, you know, on the far right or whatever. Uh, so, uh, in fact, there are many on the far right who are actually pro-abortion because it, it uh, will diminish the the uh, responsibility towards uh, caring for people, the people that will 
be careful that it be eliminated. So, but of course, people don't want to use that direct language. The uh, it's always what are called final solution. It's not you know kill kill these Jewish people, kill these Jewish children, or whatever. And the same is true in abortion and all the other things. So that. So, um, but there's always this temptation to initially compromise and then to uh, uh, and rationalize and then to uh, make a vice into a virtue. So this importance of interior dialogue with yourself and importance of, uh, it's not just, it, it's the dialogue with God, not just a dialogue with the various aspects of yourself or with, you know, outside influences in yourself. The importance of this interior dialogue of man can never be adequately appreciated, but it is also a dialogue of man with God, the author of the law, the primordial image and final end of man. St. Bonaventure teaches that conscience is like God's herald and messenger. It does not command things on its own authority, but commands them as coming from God's authority, like a herald that he proclaims the, who proclaims the edict of a king. This is why conscience has binding force. So, but a lot of people use conscience, and what they really mean is feeling. You know, I feel this, but they say, oh, my conscience tells me this. My conscience tells me this is all right. This conscience, my conscience tells me I don't have to uh, oppose this or I can go along with this. But it, it, it's not the conscience that's speaking. It's, you know, one's own rationalizations. And for conscience, we have this, uh, this inner voice, this native inner voice, but it has to be educated. It has to be informed or it will be malformed. So, you know, if we put disinformation or misinformation uh, into, the, uh, into a mind, especially a young mind, then uh, it will have terrible results. And, uh, and, and the, uh, Satan loves rationalization, just loves it. And so rather than to face earnest, uh, take a, a fearless moral inventory of oneself, uh, one, you know, uh, tries to avoid responsibility for everything. Now, of course, you know, uh, there are people who say, well, I'm responsible because I'm uh, a Caucasian, I'm uh, an American, I'm responsible for uh, what was done to people uh, uh, 200 years ago, 100 years ago, or even uh, 70 years ago, 72 years, 50, 70, 80 years ago, 100 years ago, before I existed, before my parents ever came over to this country uh, and who were suffering as Irish, but they're Irish Catholics, from their own uh, problems, uh, their own oppressions at the time. So uh, and people demand to, you know, we cough up money uh, to people nowadays. I don't see that. I see having uh, programs that work, that help people out of poverty. That's right. But uh, just because the person's skin color is it or somebody is an ancestor was a slave, but this person is doing very well financially, probably much better than I am. But what that's, I, I find that just ridiculous, appalling even. But, uh, but conscience has to be faced and we have to fa face things that if, uh, I, my own personal responsibility, but also social responsibility of that. But going back, you know, hundreds of years is, uh, you know, that's face today, face today, face responsibility, personal responsibility today, my personal responsibility, everybody else's personal responsibility in the midst of all of this. So uh, stuff like that just makes no sense to me. It just seems, frankly, greed and uh, uh, entitlement of everything, rather than taking personal responsibility and all that. So we, we need programs, we need educational programs, real education, not uh, indoctrination into, into uh, uh, absurdities or, or, uh, or 
whatever. We see this whole whole thing with the Hamas, uh, applauding Hamas. There are people who are allegedly uh, well educated from uh, uh, esteemed universities who are. Uh, uh, who are just uh, spewing basically Nazi stuff and, uh, and applauding Hamas, which is uh, you know, uh, responsible for, for bas 90% responsibility for all these horrors uh, at this point. So, uh, you know, they, I can't see this. So uh, I'm willing to be, uh, uh, quote unquote, enlightened with facts, but they have to be real facts and, and these things. So, uh, I, 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 I'm willing to change my mind if, this, if there were real facts involved in this, a real righteous thing, but it seems right now just a repetition of the 1930s in Europe. All this stuff just, uh, in the anti Semitism, the uh, the uh, again they take it and the you know and uh, you know uh, Iran and all this stuff the all the uh, uh, people who have uh, want to slit my throat because I'm American because I'm uh, and often because I'm Christian uh, that and then uh, this they don't want to call, call them to accountability. But rather often bringing the razor to their own throats. Uh, what uh, Lenin called, the people called useful, useful idiots who are, uh, who are digging the pit of their own destruction. So, conscience. This is why conscience has a binding force. And it can be said that conscience bears witness to man's own rectitude or iniquity to man himself, but together with this, and indeed even beforehand, conscience is the witness of God himself, whose voice and judgment penetrates the depths of man's soul, calling him fortier et suaviter, to obedience. Forcefully and uh, you know, smoothly, shall we say, uh, to obedience, it, it, to, it, emphatically to obedience. Moral conscience does not close man within an insurmountable and impenetrable solitude, but opens him to the call, to the voice of God. In this, and not in anything else, lies the entire mystery and dignity of the moral conscience. In being the place, the sacred place, where God speaks to man. a general address by Pope John Paul II on the 17th of August, 18, uh, 1983. 59, this is page 90. St. Paul does not merely acknowledge that conscience acts as a witness. He also reveals the way in which conscience performs that function. He speaks of conflicting thoughts, which accuse or excuse the Gentiles with regard to their behavior. Romans 2.15 again. Remember the, 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 the pagans, they're not formed by the revealed law. The term, quote, conflicting thoughts, unquote, clarifies the precise nature of conscience. It is a moral judgment about man and his actions, a judgment either of acquittal or of condemnation. According as human acts are in conformity or not with the law of God written on the heart. In the same text, the apostle clearly speaks of the judgment of actions, the judgment of their author and the movement when that judgment will be definitively rendered. Quote, this will take place on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. And my gospel, again, in the uh, written in the heart, but uh, I have to be faithful to the objective law as, as a believer, uh, as a Christian, the, uh, the law of the New Testament, the law of the New Covenant, which does not abolish moral law, but intensifies moral law. 
page 91. The judgment of conscience is a practical judgment. A judgment makes known what man must do or not do, or which assesses an act already performed by him. It is a judgment which applies to a concrete situation, the rational conviction that one must love and do good and avoid evil. The first principle of practical reason is part of the natural law. Indeed, it constitutes the very foundation of the natural law, inasmuch as it expresses that primordial insight about good and evil, that reflection of God's creative wisdom, which, like the imperishable spark, the cinchilla anime, the, uh, the spark of, of, of the soul, the, uh, shines in the heart of every man. But whereas the natural law discloses the objective and universal demands of the moral good, conscience is the application of the law to a particular case, which is sometimes we have to cut through the, the fuzziness of that. This application of the law thus becomes an inner dictate for the individual, a summons to do what is good in this particular situation. Conscience thus formulates moral obligation in the light of the natural law. It is the obligation to do what the individual, through the workings of his conscience, knows to be good. He is called to do here and now. The universality of the law and its obligation are acknowledged, not suppressed. Once reason has established the law's application in current present circumstances, the judgment of conscience states in an ultimate way whether a certain particular kind of behavior is in conformity with the law. It formulates the proximate norm of the morality of a voluntary act. So, you know, we wouldn't say, well, I'm, uh, something is virtuous if it's forced. And the uh, evil of, of an act is, is mitigated by force, but it doesn't usually <coughs> mitigate the effects of the, uh, the objective effects of the evil act. <coughs> so we'll stop there at 60 on page 92. And let's pray the Our Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs>